Thanks for joining us online today. Today's service is going to look a little bit different than normal. Over the last couple of weeks, we've had some issues with our stream that we've had to work on and to fix. The good news is, is those things are getting fixed this week, and so hopefully next week we'll be able to have the same stream that you're used to uh, and be able to watch the service live. But this week we're going to have it a little bit different. You'll still be able to hear the message and the sermon, and that will be presented to you next after this. And then there will also be a time to find ways to connect and some of the announcements that are vital to the church. As always, feel free to check our website at brownstownchristian.org or at our Facebook page or to call the church office to find out more information. As I said, we're going to be working diligently on this to make sure that our stream next week is uh, a great experience for all those um, people who are watching online. And then we're excited for some of the improvements we'll have for the future on better ways to connect you uh, to this ministry here online that we see. And so we just uh, thank you once again for being a part of this, and we look forward to seeing you later. Well, thank you so much for joining us for our second um, sermon in the series, Disciple. Last week, we started off the sermon series with talking about a lot of Peter's life. Now, Peter was an apostle, a church leader, and we saw that Peter had many moments of being um, completely dedicated to Jesus, and then moments where he struggled. Moments where he said, um, I want to go where you're going, and I'll lay down my life. And then the next moment, Jesus saying, uh, you're going to deny me three times. But yet we see that Peter had a great hope, and that hope was Jesus. And that is a living hope that we can have today in the hope of Jesus. And as we continue our sermon series on Discipled, it goes back to the mission of Brownstown Christian Church. And that mission is to help people find and follow Jesus Christ. Today, we're going to continue this study, and we're going to go into the Gospel of John. Now, this Gospel was written by the Apostle John, and we know that he's written several other books, First and Second and Third John, and then the book of Revelation, which we also find uh, all these books in the New Testament. And so today we're going to take a look at that, but before we go to the Gospel of John, as we think about our mission statement, there are two key verses that come out of Matthew 28 that I want us to review. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then verse 20 says, And teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always till the end of the age. Now this is what we remember as helping people find and follow Jesus. This is our mission, to do what Jesus has commanded, not only of the apostles, but of the church and us today. And so as we go to John chapter 8, uh, and you can turn there in your Bibles, we're going to see how we live this out and how we abide in God's Word to help us in our life. So if you have your Bibles, John chapter 8, verse 31 is where we'll start, and we'll go through verse 36. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, why are offspring, we are offspring of Abraham, 
and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. And verse 36, So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now that's from John chapter 8 as we just read in verse 31 and 30 uh, through 36. Jesus is having this conversation with some Jewish people who had believed about some of the things that were just happening. If you back up in John chapter 8, you see that there were things that were taking place. Uh, there was a festival, uh, a feast that was taking place. You can see that Jesus was uh, sharing about him being the light of the world, and different things were happening, and there were some Jews who believed. They saw some of the things that Jesus was doing, and it caused them to have interest. There's many people in this world who will have interest in Jesus. Uh, how many people that we can think of that you know that you've maybe had a conversation about Jesus? People maybe you work with, or people who maybe you go to school with, or people who are your friends. Uh, you can research about um, just Jesus' name on Google or Wikipedia. You can find information all over the place about Jesus. Uh, there's lots of films and documentaries and things that have been made about Jesus. The name Jesus and the life of Jesus is something that we see throughout our culture. Yet I think what we see here is that these Jews who had believed because they saw some of these things are now coming to the point of, are they going to be disciples? Are they going to have that true belief, that real belief? where It's not just something that they were taught, not something that they just said, okay, this uh, looks good or this, this seems okay, but something that they really believe. This is more than just belief, it's discipleship. It's saying, I want Jesus to be my master, as we talked about last week. Paul T. Butler, in his commentary on the Gospel of John, says, Abiding in the doctrine of Christ constitutes genuine discipleship. So you can think back to the brother of Jesus, James, who wrote in the book of James, James chapter 2, verse 19. You, he says, You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. See, we have to have our faith more than just belief. But it has to be grounded in we've submitted to Jesus. We've surrendered our lives to Jesus. And we've decided that he is the substitute for our penalty of sin. And we want to follow after him. We want to be his disciples. And so these Jews are in this point where they have to make a choice. Do I want to follow Jesus? Am I willing to lay down my life? Am I willing to follow what he wants? Am I willing to follow his word? Remember what our text said, that Jesus is talking to the disciples. Says, if you would abide in my word, you are truly, or the word could be really, my disciples. What does that look like to abide in his word? Well, the first point in our sermon today is that disciples abide in Jesus' words. Disciples abide in Jesus' word. See, we have to know who we are, but we also, more importantly, have to know who he is. And we learn that by hearing the word. There's scripture that talks about that, that faith comes by hearing the word of God. Um, we know that there are missionaries and preachers and evangelists and people who are sent out to declare the word of God to people. We can read the Bible and learn about our faith in Christ. But let's think about this. When we really think about abiding in Jesus, what's that really mean? Well, when I think about this, I think about several people in my life right now. I think about somebody who's lost a dear loved one, and they're struggling, looking for hope, and looking for answers, and looking for um, their questions to have understanding and meaning and purpose and some type of answer to those. 
And I think about how they need to abide in the word for help. I think about the person that's struggling right now with their family, and they're overwhelmed, to be honest, and there's so much happening and going on, and they're faithful to God and they love him, but I think a lot could be done if they spent some time abiding in his word. Even for myself, I know that there are moments where um, I get busy, I get in a hurry, I stay up too late, I um, rush to go to an appointment or work or wherever it may be, and I don't spend that time abiding in the Word. But even deeper than this, even greater than this, is I think abiding in, in the Word of Christ, abiding in, in His teaching is putting our trust there. It's not just one of those things where we say, oh, well, I've forgotten to abide in God's word. That's why everything's messed up. No, I, I think it's a, a lifelong thing. I think it's a daily thing. I think it's a, an hourly thing. I think it's deciding to say, when I struggle, I lean on him. When I, when I don't know where to turn, I turn to him. When I'm looking for help, I know who the helper is. And you can think about how Jesus... And his ministry taught these things to help us and guide us so that we could abide in his word. Maybe you've heard of the seven I am's of Jesus that he mentions and these I am statements he makes. I want to go through these today and hopefully it encourages you as a disciple who wants to abide in Jesus' word. The first is John chapter 6 verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. The bread of life. Jesus talks about how we should hunger and thirst for righteousness. Think about how important it is that we have that daily time with God, that feeding that comes from Him, how we feel malnourished or we feel under the weather when we don't have those things, or the attacks that can come or the temptation we can give into. We may go through tribulation each and every day and Knowing that the bread of life is there encourages us. The second part of that verse says, Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. How encouraging it is that he's the bread of life. The other one is in John chapter 8, verse 12. And it says, and again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. And remember, we're in John chapter 8, verse 31 through 36, and this just took place in John chapter 8, verse 12, where he says the statement, I'm the light of the world. This is what these Jews are hearing. Think about what light does. It brightens up the room. It makes the darkness disappear. It brings security. It reminds us that there's hope. It shows us where to go. And Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. And then listen to what he says. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's the life that we all want. The third one is John chapter 10, verse 9. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and I will go in and out and find pasture. What a refreshing thing to know and to bank on and to trust that we are saved completely by Jesus. A lot of times in this world, I think, even as Christians, there are moments where we doubt our faith. We start to compare the list of good and bad, or the things that we've done, or the mistakes we've made. And we start to wonder, is, is my relationship with Jesus good? And that may cause us to repent. It may cause us to think through some things. It also may cause us to look at him and say, well, he's the way. He's the door. He's where I need to walk through. He's where I need to go. He's who I need to put my trust in. The next one is John chapter 11 verse or John chapter 10 verse 11. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus cares for us. Jesus doesn't leave us out just to be attacked by the wolves, but he cares for us as a good shepherd. John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. What a powerful scripture. What a great reminder for us. What an encouraging thing to know that he is the resurrection and the life. 
You know, when I think about all the great miracles of Jesus, the resurrection is the one that, to me, is mind-boggling and uh, just a powerful example of how death couldn't hold him, sin couldn't keep him. When Jesus resurrected, he's the firstborn over all creation. He's the one who has beaten the powers of death. He was to never die again. That was it. And in his death, he had paid completely the penalty of sin. And his resurrection brings hope for us. As that verse says, that whoever believes in me, though they die, yet shall he live. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Isn't it good to know that Jesus is the way, that Jesus is the truth, and Jesus gives us the life that we need? John chapter 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. What a great reminder of the fact that we need Jesus. We need his help. We need his guidance. We need him to show us what to do. We need his teachings. And that's why when we think about abiding in word, I think about these statements that Jesus makes to remind us as we abide in his word. When we feel hopeless that he's the resurrection. When we feel powerless, reminded that he's the vine. When we don't know where to turn, he is the way, the truth, and the life. When we point people to say there's hope, that he's the door that they should walk through. See, these scriptures should encourage us as we abide in these promises. There's a quote by Sinclair Ferguson who says, Abiding in Christ means allowing his word to fill our minds, direct our wills, and transform our affections. See, abiding is not just picking up your Bible. It's not just memorizing some scripture, but it's letting that scripture be in your heart. It's what you think about, what you turn to. That abiding is to say, in the Greek, to, to continue on, to remain in. See, we, we don't want to just read the scripture and say, that sounds good or that sounds nice. We want to continue in it. We want to remain in the promises of it. We want it to guide us and direct us and to help us when we don't know where to turn, when we don't know where to go. You know, Jesus tells them, he says that if you'll just abide, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The Jews here immediately switch gears and they kind of have the wrong focus and all they're worried about is the fact that we're not slaves. What are you talking about freedom? They, they begin kind of an argument with Jesus, and they say they've never been slaves. I don't know if they forgot history or their concept of freedom, but you can look at the Old Testament and see that uh, the Jews were in slavery quite a bit. But what Jesus is talking about here is, is sin, and that we can be freed from that sin. Take just a moment and write down or jot in your mind, what has Jesus freed you from? What has Jesus freed you from in your past? What is Jesus freeing you from right now? What thing lingers in your life that you want him to free you from? And maybe think about those statements that I said of those I am's. Where do you need to abide in his word? If I was to ask you the question, are you living free, what would you say? Would you say, yeah, I'm free. I can go wherever I want. I'm not in prison or jail. But I'm talking about spiritually. Do you have freedom in Christ? Are you in Christ? And do you have that freedom that comes from Christ? Or has your past shackled you down? Are you chained by mistakes? Is your sin weighing you down like a ball and chain to where you worry when you walk into rooms? You start to clam up around certain people. You're nervous even in your own mind because you're overwhelmed by the sin that you haven't given to Jesus. And remember what he told the Jews, if you're truly my disciples, the Son can set you free. The Son has set you free. That's the beautiful thing about the Gospels, that Jesus does the work. He sets us free. You know, this past week, there was a 
an article that was done that I saw, and it was talking about some uh, services that took place in Auburn University and how there were um, tons of people who decided to give their life to Christ and to submit to Christ and to just be um, immersed into Christ and be baptized. And there were these um, players and coaches and different people, campus ministers who were all involved in this and people who were turning over their lives to Jesus. And I think what a great moment that is. But, but when I, I started to think about this, I started to think about the discipleship process that takes place because all those people who gathered there and surrendered their lives, now they're disciples. Now they're going to helpfully have someone who's going to teach them more about Jesus so that they can abide in his words so that then guess what they can do? Go and make more disciples so that they can abide in the word. And then guess what? Go and make more disciples. See, that's what it's about. We continue in the word. We continue in the faith. We continue in Jesus because we're abiding in him. We're trusting in him. You know, the Bible says that the Christian life is compared to a race. Paul says, I've ran the race. What I would just say is I think some of you maybe have taken a water break. Some may have feel like you pulled a hammy. You know, you pulled a hamstring and you're on the bench. Some may feel like you've dropped the baton and you can't race on. Some of you may feel like you're out of shape. I get that one. There's no way you can run this race. But if you abide in his word, Jesus is going to help you. That's the whole point. That's why he came, is that we don't run this race alone. You don't go to work alone. You don't go to your house alone. You don't sit in your car alone. Your thoughts are not your own by yourself. Because Jesus can be there with you. And so as disciples, we abide in this word. And our second point today that I want to point out is that disciples are are set free as we abide in the Son. We just read about how the Son sets us free. He sets us free from that guilt and shame. He sets us free because he is the one that has the power to do it. 1 John chapter 1 verse 8 says, If we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. It doesn't matter if you've only committed one sin in your life, which that's probably not anyone here or anyone anywhere. It doesn't matter if you've committed a hundred sins or a thousand. Jesus came to pay the penalty for all sins, and he's the only one to ever not sin. He lived the perfect life so that we could abide in him. And so that we can know that all his promises are yes and amen. So that we can know that he is the way, the truth, and the life. So that we could put our life in his hands and abide in him and abide in his word. But abiding in Christ takes work. Running a race takes work. And there's training that has to happen, preparation that has to take place. And it's continually working on this. This means you're going to have to give effort. And sometimes this effort will go against culture. It's Saturday night. Have as much fun as you want. Live up the weekend. You can oversleep for church. It's not that big of a deal. You know what? I don't really feel like reading the Bible this week or I'm so busy. It's not going to be that big of a deal. What's one day? What's one week? What's one month? You know, I think that's something that God's been showing me is is really all of us have this great opportunity to abide in his word. And he just wants to meet with us. He just wants to talk to us. He just wants us to to share what's going on and to hear his truth. A lot of times I think there's questions we asked, or questions we, we do ask, and we want answers. But I've learned in just this past week that sometimes we don't want to listen first. We just want to ask. And so what if abiding for you meant just to start to listen to what God said or what he may be saying, what he may be trying to get, but you have to block out some of the noise, some of the distractions. You know, just last week we talked about this whole idea of Peter having this life of 
one moment it was really good and the next moment he his faith wasn't so strong one moment he's walking on water the next moment he's falling in but Peter wasn't afraid to take chances to take risks to be bold and I think he tried to abide in in the word he tried to abide in Jesus but it was difficult and what can happen, I think, is that we fall sometimes or we're afraid of falling. We're, we don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want anyone to think that, well, they've made a mistake or they've messed up. Or we don't want anyone to, to know what's happening in our life. And so we block off any type of community or real relationships or um, we're, we're afraid to be too vocal about our relationship with God. I know for even me, being a minister, that there have been times in my life where I kind of purposely try not to introduce myself that way because it immediately puts up guardrails with people or roadblocks with people, and they think automatically if I want to talk about Jesus, it's because I'm trying to get them to come to church, when really I just want them to be disciples of Jesus. And so in the past, sometimes I've maybe not been as vocal as I should have been or that maybe I was hesitant to pray when I probably should have or maybe not as quick to, to listen or to be um, offering a, encouragement. And I think about those things and I think about how God has taught me and worked in my life to help me to abide in Him and that I try to listen to what he wants and what his spirit is, is saying and that in those moments I would try to do what he asks. Um, and like Peter, there are moments where I feel, all right, Lord, where you're going, I'm going. And there are moments where I know Jesus says, Mitchell, calm down. You're going to mess up tomorrow. But that's the wonderful thing about Jesus is that even though we go through the struggle in life of one moment we're here and the next moment we're there, and His forgiveness is every day, His mercies are new every day. One of my favorite people in the Old Testament is King David. And King David's caught in a sin that he committed and covered up. And Nathan the prophet comes to confront him and to tell him that he is this man. And David has this beautiful repentance that he writes in Psalm 51. And he says this, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Some of us need that today. Some of us need God to create that clean heart. Some of us need to lay down a hurt or a habit some type of hang-up that we have from our past. Some of us are overwhelmed and tired, and we need to take a deep breath and rest. Some of us, myself, we need to realize that if God can hold the whole world in his hands, then surely he's going to take care of the, the things that I face, and his ways are better than my ways. And so right now, I, I really feel this desire just to pray that. And so would you just pray with me right now in the middle of this sermon? Lord, I, I do pray that you help us to have that new heart today, Lord. That whatever we need to lay down, whatever we need to, to give over to you, that we would do that. Lord, help us. To follow you help us to abide in you lord help us to abide in your word and maybe it may it be something that is just guided by you may you help us in all these ways we pray this in jesus amen demario davis for the new orleans saints took advantage of this and in a press conference he made uh, a speech about jesus and shared scripture and, and preached a sermon. And he did this basically saying there's a lot of people who work on Sundays and as football players there. And so he just shared scripture and he just shared this testimony and this sermon. 
And I think that was a wonderful thing to see and to hear. And I just think about he took that opportunity to be bold for Christ. And obviously that word had been abiding in his life. And so that brings to our third point is that disciples abide in Christ with their whole lives. That took guts to go on national TV, to be on every video, every social media platform, and him to say that, listen, Jesus is standing at the door knocking for you. But we have to remember Christ doesn't leave us. It wasn't just him up there by himself. It was the Holy Spirit working through him. You go a little bit further on in our study of John and In John 15, there's this beautiful passage that we see, and I want to read it to us. It says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Sound familiar? Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into a fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples." The Jews at the very beginning believed and had believed in Jesus. And he asked them, if you're going to be my disciples, you have to abide in my word. You have to abide in my teachings. You know, Robert Coleman has a wonderful quote here from him. There's a quote from Robert Coleman I want to share. It says, it all started by Jesus calling a few men to follow him. This revealed immediately the direction his evangelistic strategy would take. His concern was not with programs to reach multitudes, but with men whom the multitudes would follow. See, I think oftentimes we complicate it too much. We overthink it. We overanalyze it. And sometimes we um, miss the simple answer that we need to find and follow Jesus to be disciples making disciples who then make disciples. But how do we do that? How do we live that out in our day-to-day life? Well, there's a book called Discipleship that Jim Putman and Bobby Harrington have authored. And in that they talk about these four share, uh, sp- and in that book they talk about these four spears of a disciple and how a disciple grows. Here's the first one they talk about. In relationship to God. Think about in your walk with Jesus. Maybe you've been a follower for many years. And oftentimes I meet with people who make decisions at young ages and they say, I've learned so much since I've become a Christian. And my response is usually simple. Good, you're supposed to. We're not supposed to stay the same. It's not one of those things where we check the box and we're done. It's a lifelong process. And being a disciple who abides in Christ does it with their whole life. And so their relationship with God is about growing, knowing him more, leaning on him, trusting him. The second one, they say, is in his relationship with God's family, the church. The bride of Christ, a beautiful thing. There are so many people in our church who I'm so thankful for how they've ministered to others, how they've ministered to me, how they continue to minister. See, I want you to understand that everything that's done in our church is by the family of God. It's disciples working together. There are so many people who work behind the scenes just to make this possible. Many people who do things before services and after services to make that possible. People who are teaching and encouraging. People who are Uh, praying and uh, making time to reach out to those in need, caring for those who are afflicted. And see, that's the wonderful thing is that our relationship with one another should increase. Uh, I've been at 
Brownstown Christian Church for over six years now, and some of the relationships I've built here, I am so thankful of how God has guided me and directed me, and it's helped me in my life and helped me in my faith. And I'm thankful that we have that. And, and, and I want to encourage you to be part of those communities, to build those relationships. And, and really the best way that's going to happen at our church is to be involved in ministries. So being involved in some type of ministry or to be involved in some type of class or some type of study. If you just come on Sundays, it may be hard to find that community. But I'd love to talk to you or I'd love for you to reach out to our church office and talk about some of those things. The third thing he says is in his home life, uh, in a disciple's life at home. I want to say something here that for many of you, you may think, well, I don't know who to disciple. It may start at home with your family, with your kids, with your extended family. It may be people that you haven't seen in a while in your family. But let's start just in your home. Let's just start with those who are there and how you can make a difference in their life, how you can point them to Jesus, how you can share about finding and follow Jesus with them. The fourth one is in our relationship to the world. I think that we grow farther away from this world and the way that it operates, but yet we live in it, bringing hope of Jesus, that living hope. We share that this world is not our home. We share that this world is not uh, where we're putting our trust. But there will be a new world and a new heaven. And that's where we put our security in is Jesus preparing that for us. And so our life should be changed as we grow as disciples, abiding in him. You know, there's a song that this past week that God really used to minister to me and to one of my good friends. And as I was sharing this with him, he, uh, he had told me that God had used this song to minister to him, and God brought this to both of our attentions separately, but then uh, just through our conversations together. And as he shared this, I just want to share the, the chorus of this song. It says, in my life be lifted high, in our world be lifted high, in our love be lifted high. That's where I want Jesus to be, lifted high in my life, in this world, and the way that I love people. And the best way for that to happen is for me to abide in his word so that he can abide in me. Thank you so much for being here with us today, and I pray that God's word has blessed you, and we, uh, we love you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for those who have watched, and Lord, I pray that you bless them, that you help them, that you guide them. Lord, I pray that, uh, Lord, they heard from you, not from me. And Lord, I pray that you just send this message out and use it for your word, for your glory. Lord, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us online this morning at Brownstown Christian Church. If you would like to get connected here at BCC or would like to be able to submit a prayer request, we would love for you to text CONNECT to the number at your bottom, the bottom of your screen or to scan the QR code here. We have a couple of events happening here at the church that we would love to invite you to. First, on September 30th, Ryan Stevenson is going to be here for a concert. It's going to be a great night of worship and you don't want to miss out. So scan the QR code or visit our website to grab a ticket today. Finally, we have our next round of DC28, Brownstown's discipleship training, that is going to be happening starting at the end of September through October. You can see the dates here on your screen and you can sign up with the QR code. Thank you again for joining us. We hope you have a great rest of your week.